How do you build the best Summoner Duels team? Well, you start with the delivery system. Are you warping in? Are you using Pathfinder? Or are you using Raid Boss? In this series, we're going to talk about the different delivery systems of a Summoner Duels team. And let's start with warping. Now, are you a warper? <laughs> do you like Whoa. unexpected jumps? Do you think earth rendering is the greatest skill ever created? Do you play base? <laughs> Warping teams deliver their damage dealers by allowing units to jump to squares regardless of terrain, and the range can be anywhere from adjacent to the unit to two spaces away. It allows for a lot of adaptability and the use of a lot of different units. It's the reason they're probably the most popular strategy. Now your warp enablers are Ash, Summertana, Bridal Catria, and any Guidance or Orders user. We're going to talk in terms of Ash because she's free and is the best facilitator for this strategy. She thrives on maps with weird terrain and obstacles in the middle. She can make for very elegant plays, but doesn't have the largest of threat ranges. This means that if you have a wide open map, a savior is probably required. The good news is the saviors will have increased mobility because of the warping. Warping caters to the slower, more methodical players. Let's look at this example. I used warp both as a setup mechanism and as a means to go on the offensive. You can see how nicely clumped my units stay so that each one can support each other. You can also see how valuable Kanto is in these kinds of strategies, but you need the extra power to overwhelm invested raid bosses and enemy savior units. It's also worth noting that this is Summoner Duels S, and every Pathfinder team I found, I definitely vetoed. Now, strengths. Because of the proximity, it becomes very easy to stack effects like triangle attack or give stats through buffs or other kinds of drives. It means you can take down very invested units. This team has excellent overlap. Now, when you have multiple threats, it's easy to choose which unit to attack because so many can hit the same spots. It's also easy to cover your units with saviors. Ash thrives on maps with weird terrain and obstacles in the middle. The map I'm showing is a great example. The blocks allowed for some pretty fantastic plays that other teams just simply wouldn't be able to pull off. You'll also notice that this team didn't have saviors. The terrain provided the needed protection from expendable nukes and gave an extra slot for another type of unit. Weaknesses. Pathfinder teams are absolutely fantastic at picking off targets with their expendable nukes. It means you have to be cautious about dictating the terms of how they approach. The low threat range means it can be hard to initiate. It's why you see a lot of these teams paired with a unit like Harmonic Sonya or Yuri to extend their range. Because of the nature of these teams, they're generally reactionary, relying on the other team to make the first move. This is why when two of these teams meet, you get into a prolonged standoff. It's also why Kanto is popular with these teams. The ability to reach outside of your bubble and then retreat back in is just invaluable. Let me know in the comments if you're using Ash. She's definitely one of the best free units we've gotten, and I think she is absolutely spectacular. But let's talk about the warping team's nemesis, which is Pathfinder. <laughs> now, are you a Pathfinder? Do you have no regard for your hero's safety? Are you incredibly impatient? Do you wear hot pants in the throne room? <laughs> Now, Pathfinder teams extend the range of their units through the use of the Pathfinder skill, which essentially gives you a free movement tile. Pathfinder teams are all about the quick strike. The openers take an incredible amount of work and either function or they don't. The Jotunheimer sisters work well with glass cannons. They thrive on maps with wide open spaces. Saviors aren't required, but they can help cover the setup from other quick strike teams. This means that saviors can be fairly cheap because they really only have to take one hit. Now, the matches that I'm showing really showcase the range of units that are viable in Pathfinder strategies. I'm using Gen 1 Arden, Gen 2 Sonya, Gen 3 Raphael, and yeah, Yuri. <laughs> 
The combination of physical and magical damage enabled the team to take out a lot of different kinds of units. These strategies are really won and lost on turn one though. I was also very, very leery of raid bosses. So the enablers are fairly obvious, duo dogger, dogger, and note. Pathfinder strategies require a ton of setup, but they do result in quicker match times. That can appeal to the um, ADD folks among us. <laughs> The glass cannons you use are generally cheap in regards to merges since they're not required to live. You're only worried about attack and speed, and that's it. It means that it's easy to use the latest and greatest nuke that just came out and just plug them into your team. High threat range allows for a great deal of adaptability on turn one. You can choose the means in which you engage and that's a huge advantage, but turn two can be a bit problematic, which leads us into the weaknesses. Turtles who simply wait out turn one setups and then pick your team apart afterwards are a real problem. This happens more often than you think, but it's worth noting that you'll at least gain capture points. Setups can be quite complicated. My last one took a full week to develop and not everyone has that kind of time but I am expecting that time to go down as we start to repeat maps. Raid bosses are easily their biggest enemy because you don't generally have added support from the rest of your team. You get a lot of 1v1 situations since raid bosses put a priority on bulk. They can often counter anything you have. Speaking of raid bosses, are you a raid boss? <laughs> Do you like building one unit that destroys absolutely everything? Have you invested a lot into bonus doubler? <laughs> Do you have an I heart fallen Edelgard t-shirt? <laughs> now, raid bosses are a small segment of fey units that require a mix of high bulk, damage reduction, and high attack. Every unit on the team needs to support the raid boss in some way. The brain power is mostly spent on the team design for these comps, but that can take a lot of iterations. A common misconception is that these are brain dead strategies and I have to disagree. It can be very difficult on the front end to get all the units into the right place. Refining the individual components can take days of work, but if it's done right, the gameplay looks very easy. Fallen Edelgard is the prototypical raid boss, but I've seen strategies with Ascendant Merida, Noe, Spring Mer, but let's take a look here at Jackal's plus 10 Fallen Edelgard. This is something to behold. Now, this is the Fallen Shield variety, and this unit has enough speed to double a lot of units with the combination of Adroit Captain. These are the kind of stat stacking strategies I'm talking about though. This is a ton of support dedicated to one unit that can absolutely wreak havoc on other teams. Now the enablers, Legendary Elwood is the king, and if you're serious about this strategy, you need to have him. Astrid gives extra movement, but the fact that she has to rally a unit to give them those effects wastes a precious action. Units like August that give effects from afar are incredibly valuable, and I'd expect to see more of them in the future. Buff givers are also incredibly valuable. We've discussed it, but gameplay is generally easy. The means of moving across the map is usually as simple as smite. The simplicity of the scheme means it fits most maps. It means that you in general don't have to overhaul your opener for every single map and this can cut down on setup time. And you'll normally see these strategies just dominating maps in the very first days before the other strategies can really get going. If done right, this kind of team just hard counters other teams and I'll admit that's incredibly satisfying. Now, weaknesses. These are very expensive teams. Every point in almost every stat counts. So you want merges, flowers, florets, summoner support, everything you can possibly put on this unit. Since such a few number of these units exist, it usually means that the community recognizes them very quickly and creates counters for them. That's tough because they cost so much and expire so quickly. The other big counter is warping teams. They can usually build up enough strength to take down raid bosses, particularly when they include Bridal Catria. 
It makes engagement tricky. We've talked about all of these different delivery systems. I wanna discuss just a little bit some of the advanced strategies. And once you get the basics of the delivery systems, you'll find that they often work together and the lines get just a little bit blurred. For instance, you can use a Pathfinder team to deliver a raid boss deep into the enemy backfield. That works best with units like Merida and Legendary Dimitri that I'm showing here. You sacrifice the additional support for greater mobility. My latest Summoner Duels team used Pathfinder to get the team set up on turn one and then used Warping on turn two. What this did was sacrifice the Quick Strike ability but gave you more power in the subsequent turns. Combining strategies like this can give you extra unpredictability, which is a key to a lot of wins, but that's a topic for another episode. Summoners, you've gotta love this kind of counterplay. You'll find good players in each of these categories, although sometimes a map will favor one style over another. My last team had different modes depending on how the player played, but that's a subject for another episode. In our next episode, we're going to talk about nukes and how to deal with units like Brave Hector. <laughs> Thank you very much for watching. Take care and schedule an appointment with your fail just real soon.